Welcome back to Virtual School Assembly. Today, our guest is Katie Von Till. Katie holds the distinction of being the fourth official voice of Disney's Snow White since 1937. She voices for princesses on toys, video games, theme parks, and animated programs. Uh, and on TV, Katie uh, currently recurs as the newscaster on Young Sheldon and as a comedy sketch player on Conan. Um, other appearances included NCIS, uh, the Middle, How I Met Your Mother, Community, Game Shakers. She has done a lot in Hollywood. Um, in addition to the voice work and the acting, she's also a producer. And she recently had a feature uh, selected as a jury selection for the Austin Film Festival. So she's really covering her bases there in Hollywood. Uh, Katie can be seen at, in many national commercials and she toured for the US in the Broadway first national tour of Little Shop of Horrors, which is a fantastic show. So we're gonna dig into all this. Uh, first, Katie, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, you have been busy. Uh, and as we mentioned before the call, you know, even during quarantine, you're learning, you're growing, you're hustling and, and finding different things to do. I, I love that. And I'm, I'm so excited to kind of dig into your story, but let's go back in time and start at the beginning. Sure. When were you first interested in theater and, and creating things for other people? Yeah, well, uh, I have kind of an interesting story. Uh, my dad actually got me into performing. He had, my brother is about six years older than me, and my father had coached his little league team. And just as that helped him bond with my brother, he was looking for a similar activity to bond with me. I am not athletic. I was not going to be playing at any sports uh, well anyway. And he saw an audition in the newspaper for a community theater production of Annie. And he thought, well, we could do that together. So I auditioned and my dad auditioned. Oh, no way. And we both got cast together and we started doing community theater together. It was, it was really pretty awesome. So I, I kind of owe everything to my dad. That is really cool. Um, and especially fun that you could keep that in the family. So many people that start out on any endeavor in life, whether that's sports or theater or anything else, they're often doing it by themselves. But how fun to do that with your family. That's really cool. Yeah, really fun. My brother's actually an artist, too. He's a musician and a singer. And I think that, um, you know, my dad is a lawyer, but he always wanted to go into the arts. So I think he and my mom kind of live vicariously through us. Right. Well, that's really cool. So community theater at a young age, did you do like drama and theater when you were in high school? Yeah, I, I participated in uh, the shows in high school. We did, uh, we had a fall drama every fall. We had a spring musical. Um, I have one famous classmate, more famous than myself, named Linda Cardellini, who I'm sure you've seen in a lot of things. And we did shows together. Uh, yeah, so I did I still did community theater in through high school, actually. And so I did community theater and high school theater at the same time. And then I went to Michigan State University, where I studied vocal music performance uh, with a merit scholarship for that and uh, theater. Oh, cool. Well, I, so I talked to a Michigan grad yesterday. We need to have him Ooh, come on boo, and you guys can go boo, at it. Yeah. Michigan, boo. <laughs> That's fun. So I'm a Badger and a Hoosier. So we've oh. got the Midwest covered. Um, <laughs> A lot Big of fun. Ten. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I I love the community theater aspect. That's we're we're in a small town here in southern Utah, and community theater is a big deal. Um, sure. An easy way to see what you can do and what you're capable of on the stage. Um, a cool entry into that world. When did you start thinking Hollywood was maybe a possibility in your future? You know, I knew by high school that performing was the career I wanted to pursue. Mm. Um, I'm not sure I really understood what that meant, right. but I knew that I loved it. I knew that I was good at it. And I, I wanted to do something for a living that I loved. I mean, I, you know, I got a fallback degree. I thought about going to law school. You know, I, I had some plan Bs just in case, but I, I knew in high school that this was it for me. That's really cool. So, Talk about your journey then. How did you end up uh, in LA and, and what was that journey like? Yeah, well, I'm a California native. I'm from San Jose, California. Okay. Uh, when I was at Michigan State, a lot of our graduates there end up in Chicago because it's the nearest big city. Uh, but the chair of my department uh, stopped me in the hall one day, Dr. Dixie Durr, who is 
unfortunately uh, passed away, she stopped me and said, what are your plans after graduation? And I said, well, I guess I'll go to Chicago like everybody else. And she said, no, you should go to New York. You're really talented. You have a shot at this. And so I really owe it to her and my teachers who really encouraged me to think that I could take the leap. Uh, I'm not sure I could have done that without their encouragement. So I really owe a lot to uh, my university professors, uh, Frank Rutledge and Dixie Durr, my high school drama teacher, uh, Laura Rose. They really pushed me to think that I, I had a shot. You know, it's one thing to think about it in your own you know, mind and your own daydreaming, but for somebody else to see it within you and to push you in that direction is invaluable. That's so really thanks, funny. teachers. <laughs> yeah, and listen, students out there, your teachers know what they're talking about. So. They really do, yeah. <laughs> Good, well, so you've, you've been now in Hollywood for a while. You've had a lot oh, of- Oh, well, I went to, so I went to New York first. I was in New York for four years. I started my career in musical theater, and so that right. seemed the likely place to go. And then um, musical theater was really struggling for a while and auditions were getting more and more um, competitive. And I was, I was yearning to be back in California. I was in New York, it was 28 degrees outside. I was <laughs> waiting, sitting on the pavement in, in, on the sidewalk, waiting for a building to open for a sign in that would begin an hour after that for then an audition that would begin an hour after that. And I said to the gal next to me, I said, I'm gonna go count where we are in line. So I counted where we are in line and I realized I was gonna be 40th on the alternate list. I wasn't even going to get an audition slot that day. And I thought, I can tough this out, but I'm not sure I can tough it out in 28 degree weather. Uh, I bet this is much more humane in my native California where I can sit in, in my car or sit outside and not, and not freeze. Right. So that's what I did. Huh. Now let's talk about New York for just a minute. Um, since mm -hmm. we're there, uh, you had the opportunity of doing Little Shop. I'm guessing that wasn't your first thing that you went out for. Um, what was it like getting those first um, appearances and 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 gigs there in New York? What? You yeah. Know, well, walk through that. I was a I was a singing waitress on the Spirit of New York cruise ships that go around New York Harbor. Uh, I did uh, touring productions of kids' shows for schools, um, and actually that's how I got my equity card. Uh, the Actors' Equity Association is the union for stage actors, mm -hmm. and by traveling through the Midwest, actually, I got um, my membership in the union by performing at schools for students. Oh. And once I joined the union, um, it was a lot easier for me to make a living doing what I do. Uh, prior to that, you know, doing some non-union things here and there, it was, it was really not a sustainable way to live. Right. And I always had to have side jobs and so forth. I mean, we always have side jobs, but it, right. it was more like my acting was my side job and temping and things like that or working in an office were my, my day job. And, you know, I certainly didn't want to live that way. I wanted to have a career. And the way to have a career in the arts is to join unions, which is Actors' Equity, and also for television, film, and radio, uh, SAG-AFTRA. Right. So for 99% of people who pursue acting, they stay in that area that you were just talking about, where they have a full-time job and then, or par several part-time jobs, and then get anything they can get on the side as far as acting. What for you made the switch to where now acting was your primary thing and you did other things on the side? Yeah, it was, it was the union. That's the thing that allowed, that's where you get proper wages. You get proper compensation for the work that you do. Um, you're not taken advantage of for uh, television, film, and radio. It means you get residuals. So every time that show or that program airs again, you get a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, basically actors are kind of the lowest rung of the totem pole in Hollywood. People think we make a lot of money and so forth. The, the average working class actor, which is what I am, um, you know, we, we live very much paycheck to paycheck and, you know, we never know where our next gig is going to come from. You've got to be really smart about um, saving money and budgeting and things like that because you just never know. But I've been really lucky. I haven't needed a day job since 2005. Wow. And the reason was I booked that national tour of Little Shop of Horrors, which was a great um, equity job that, you know, got me health insurance and uh, paid, paid, for, paid for me because I was touring. 
uh, I was able to bank all the money because we, you know, most of your housing and whatnot is covered. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was able to really start to save a bunch of money. I also worked um, a non-union gig actually at Tokyo Disneyland uh, several years before that, which was another thing that they provide housing and transportation. So I was able to to bank that money. So any any chance an actor gets to get a good paycheck and, and bank that money, I really encourage them to do so. Because, um, the, let me, uh, I'll tell you this, up until uh, two years ago, I was driving the same car I'd been driving since I was 16. Uh -huh. You gotta live frugally. Right. You, I have housemates in my house. I, you know, if you really wanna make it as an actor, you have to, you have to figure out how to make the money work. Right. Well, and, and one of the things I've learned in talking to a lot of actors over the last several months is even the actors who have, quote, made it, they're still living frugally because there's no guarantee what they're going to get a year from now, two years from now. And so having housemates, driving the same car for years and years, even really famous Hollywood actors are living that way because it's such a fickle business. And so it's, it's really It's smart. really fickle. Yeah, it's really fickle. And um you know, right now it's shut down for the most part. Right. There is no work right now. Um, there is some voice work happening, um, but you know, a lot of voice work goes hand in hand with on-camera work and that is shut down. Right, well, let's talk about voice work for a minute because a lot sure. of kids don't know that side of, of Hollywood or, or that the industry in general. Um, how did you first land your first voice jobs? And, and just explain a little bit what that industry is like. Sure. Well, it actually started on the tour of Little Shop of Horrors. I was um, at an airport with a fellow cast member of mine, at Latonya Holmes, and she said, you have such an interesting voice, you should do voiceover. And I had always heard that. I took a couple of classes, but investing in a, a voiceover career is very expensive. You have to get great equipment. You, you need to study, you need to know people, you need to produce a demo. It can be really expensive up front to get going. And I thought, well, I wasn't sure I wanted to put all that money forward for something that wasn't necessarily going to be a good return. And she was like, oh, no, I think I can just introduce you to my agents and, and they might sign you. And I was like, hmm, okay. They didn't, but I told that story to another friend named Megan Strange, who you can look up. She's done a ton of voice work. And she said, oh, well, let me introduce you to my agents. And that was SBV. And they signed me, which was fantastic. And I, and I started working right away. I actually made my demos after I had signed with them and started investing wow. in equipment after that. But I, I grew up as a little kid, I don't know about other people, really loving Disney movies. You know, every kid sort of wants to grow up and be a Disney princess. What I didn't know was that I could grow up to be a Disney princess that already existed. So I am the voice of Snow White for Disney. I have been for the last 11 years. Um, I do voices you know, for all kinds of products and shows for them. And it's a really wonderful thing to be part of such a legacy and part of such a dream that I had that I, I didn't even know it was a thing. So basically what I do is called voice matching. So the voice of Snow White is actually Adriana Castellotti, the first woman who voiced her in 1937. And since she's obviously not with us any longer, that was a very long time ago, um, the voice has gone on to various other actresses over time. And uh, now it's me. So what I do is I match the voice that Adriana Casalotti did. Right. Which is and so it, it's because I'm a good mimic, you know, if you're really good with, I'm a musical person, obviously, so I'm great with pitch and tempo and things like that. I'm just absolutely a parrot. So... I'm able to uh, approximate other people's voices. And I've made other things of that too. I actually voice, um, I voice match Kristen Wiig's character in the How to Train Your Dragon video game, um, as well as the theme park. And it's another thing where I just, you know, cop copy somebody. And right. when, it, when big celebrities uh, like Kristen Wiig, she's not available necessarily to do the smaller jobs, right? She's available to do the movies, but it's not financially it doesn't make financial sense for her to do the games and it doesn't make financial sense for the the game industry to pay her what it would need to be for her to to take the time to do those things right. so I've done quite a bit of voice matching actually and I really really I really enjoy it yeah well so I love this we haven't talked about voice work yet on the show um, mm -hmm. but I, what I love about this is there are opportunities I mean who who doesn't 
well, I didn't grow up dreaming of being a Disney princess, but my daughter <laughs> sure did. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, what a dream come true, but it's hard work, right? I, I know even now during quarantine, you're taking classes, you're working yeah. on your craft. Um, I'm, in, I'm in acting class twice a week. And what I would say is a lot of people think that voice acting is just, oh, I have a great voice. You have to be an amazing actor. You cannot be a voice artist without being a great actor because that's what it is. It's acting. In fact, it's even harder than on-camera acting because you don't have the visual to go with what you're trying to convey. Um, I've had a lot of great actor friends of mine who are like, I want, to give, I want to give voiceover a shot, and they just can't do it. So what I would say is the great thing about voiceover is you can be anywhere now and do it. You can be anywhere. I have friends who do voiceover who live in Colorado and the mountains and, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, rural areas, city areas all over the country. You can be anywhere in the world. Um, I was the voice of a network for a while. And if I had to go out of town, I could do the job from out of town. Uh, but it's so much more to be really successful. You need to be a great actor. It's, it's, it's much more difficult than people think. <laughs> right, but I, I think one of the advantages of voice work, you, you mentioned earlier that it's expensive, the barrier to entry is pretty high, but that is changing. Uh, it uh, is, equipment, technology, equipment is yeah. dropping and, and availability. Yeah, but I will say it's changing as far as the smaller jobs. You're not gonna get a voice on a cartoon with your USB mic plugged into your laptop. That's not going to happen. Upstairs in my house, I've got a full studio. Um, it's, um, you know, acoustic panels and foam, and I have a Neumann mic and a Sennheiser mic and, and you know, interfaces and mixers and ISDN coming into the house. Yep. It's, um, if you want the big jobs, the jobs that are going to give you a career, the union jobs that take care of its talent, um, you need, you need uh, better equipment. And... Yep. Um, even with prices coming down, it can be quite expensive. Yeah, well, and-, and But there are other it. jobs that are like, you know, you can do, you can be paid to do someone's voice on their voicemail. You can be paid to do some educational videos and things like that where you voice those things. There are absolutely jobs out there for um, the uh, less equipped person to book. But yeah, you're not gonna book those national commercials or, or animated programs. Uh, without the equipment. Yeah. The, the cool thing is there are a lot of different possibilities. I mean, even right now, I'm looking for someone to do voiceover for the intro and outro of this podcast, which I uh -huh. haven't set that up yet. So there, there are lots of little things like that that you can reach out. And, and I, I like what you said about, you know, barrier to entry for the low gigs is reasonable. And then to go pro, you need yeah. to invest in things. And the same applies. A lot of kids out there are thinking, well, I want to be a YouTube star. Well, you can make YouTube videos on the cheap, but if you want to be Mr. Beast or Dude Perfect, you're going to be investing money into your equipment and, and they're taking acting classes and they're doing That's things right. like that to improve their craft. So it, it's not easy to be an overnight sensation in Hollywood. It takes there years There is no years. such thing. Right. <laughs> there is no such, you meet anybody and they're like, you're an overnight sensation. And, and they'll be like, oh, I've been working for 10 years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, the, the crazy, uh, the example I love of that is the, the big overnight sensation 10 years ago that we were all talking about was Justin Bieber. And Justin Bieber was this YouTube kid that grew, blew up overnight. But he had even been gigging and doing things for 10 years. I, he literally right. started as a three or four year old and was yep. putting videos out. And even for him, Overnight Sensation took 10 years. Yeah, it's a good 10 years, I would say. I mean, it took me, I, from when I graduated college to when I could be a full-time actor, it was eight years. It was eight years. Wow. And that's, that's actually, like you said, because 10 is kind of the average right. uh, for those that do make it. Most people never do. Most people never make it. They give up. Mm -hmm. um, they give up because often because they have to. I'm very lucky right. that I had a support system to help me in those early years when things were lean. I'm also really a go-getter and a hustler. So I'm always, back in the early days, I was always trying to find ways to make money and um, sustain myself while pursuing uh, legitimate acting, which right. is what I, I consider legitimate acting and most people consider professional acting, um, those union jobs. Right. Uh, that's, that's the only way to be a, a real professional in this business is to be in the unions. Um, 
And I was lucky, I was able to join Actors' Equity a year after graduating from college. And then a couple of years after that, I joined um, what was the Screen Actors Guild at the time and AFTRA, which have now merged into one, which makes it a lot easier to get healthcare. <laughs> um, and yeah, but I like to say to people that being an actor is basically being a lifelong student. I am constantly studying. I'm working on my craft. I'm learning other things about my business so I can stay in it, particularly as a woman. Um, aging in this business, you're going to hit pockets where you don't have as many roles. It's like, you know, you first you're not old enough to be a mom, then you're old enough to be a mom, then you're too old to be the mom, but not old enough to be the grandma. You know, so I've been learning about uh, other things. I've, I've diversified my acting portfolio. That's how I've survived, right? I do stage, I do voiceover, I do film and television, I do commercials. And so when one area of my business is falling, something else will be picking up. And I think, I think diversifying what you do is probably the most important thing to survive in this business. Yeah. And, and more and more so that's true of any business. Uh, we're sure. we're lo living in a time now where diversification is so important. Yeah. Katie, so I spend my time reading and writing and going to classes and learning and listening to podcasts and watching webinars, you know, right. it's a constant, um, it's school. It's school forever. So if you don't like school, don't try to be an actor. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So we've talked about some of the realities and some of the hard things about Hollywood. Let's talk about some of the highs. Um, aside from Snow White, what's a favorite project or, or a role that you've had or something that you've worked on that you really had a good time with? Well, the two jobs that I have right now that recur are wonderful because so often as an actor in television, film, and voiceover, we don't have unless you're a series regular on a show you don't have a cast that you know a crew that you know you're just there for a day or two working mm -hmm. and you know the guest cast is constantly going in and out so nobody really cares that you're there your job is just to push the story along to support the lead characters it's not it's hard for actors to realize like it's not about you it's really it's really about the whole pro project which is what i love about you know collaborative type of work, which is what acting is. It's, you know, it's so many different types of people, the cast, the crew, the producers, the directors, everybody together is what makes the final product. But having jobs that I go back to uh, is the best feeling. So when I show up at Young Sheldon, it's, oh, Katie, so great to have you here again. How are you? How have you been? You know, talking to the makeup artist. Well, how's your mom? She was sick last time we, I was here. You know, you really build more of a sense of community. Same with the the people over at Conan, I've, I've been doing sketches at Conan for several years and it's great to show up and the writers are like, hey, we wrote this for you. So glad you were able to come in today. Um, there's no better feeling than being part of a cast, a cast and a crew that are working together. And the only way to really be a part of that is if you're there again and again. And so those are the best jobs for me where I can, you know, feel a sense of belonging and that uh, I can, can contribute. Those are my favorite gigs. Yeah. So looking to the, the future, in a perfect world, if you could land your dream role with any cast, any director, um, what would be like that dream gig for you? Well, the ultimate dream gig for me would be um, a multi-camera sitcom because they have sort of real working hours, it's kind of like a nine to five. You know, when you're shooting a single cam sitcom or a drama, you can have 14 hour days, 16 hour days. They are long. Um, but the schedules for multi-camera comedies are much more humane. I also like that many of them are shot in front of a live audience. So that same feeling I felt as a theater performer where I'm feeding off of the audience's energy is what I get to do when I do that. So I'd love to be able to collaborate not only with my my fellow artists but also with the audience about what we're what we're creating and then on my summer hiatuses I'd love to go back to doing you know Broadway type shows cool. that would be that would be the, the dream <laughs> that's cool well you're you're well on your way towards that um, as we wrap up here what's your your final words of advice for any kid out there who thinks they might want to pursue Hollywood and and look at a career in there, what advice would you give them as far as preparation and looking forward to a career uh, in Hollywood? Well, the first thing I would say is don't wait. 
most of us, you were talking about YouTube and things like that. I'm not talking about, you know, trying to make a living right now as a kid, right? I'm talking about flexing your creative muscles with the things that you have at home. You know, I, California's a hot spot right now and I am staying home. I don't want to be ill or get ill or get someone else ill because I was careless or selfish or anything like that. I, you know, we're so lucky that this is happening at this point in time when we have things like this, where you and I can connect right. across the country with each other. You know, you can, we, you and I could be acting together right now. We could, we could be doing a scene right now. Most people or a lot of people have at least access to a smartphone. They all have cameras now. Like, you know, shoot sketches with your family, write scenes with your family, um, watch and learn, you know, this is going to sound a little controversial, but you know, watching TV is a job for me. So when you when you're when you're watching movies or television with your family, really think about well, if I were in this show, where would I fit in, or who's who's playing the role that I think I could play, you know, and start to think about that. But we're because we're stuck at home, we you know you you've got nothing but time to be creative and create your own stuff. Even as a little kid, you know, well, I was a kid before internet and all that stuff. You know, my friends and I in the neighborhood would put on shows and my brother and I would perform for our parents. I would just start being creative right now and, and don't think about what, what that will lead to. You know, part of being a successful actor is, is trial and error. You have to do a lot of failing before you can figure out what works. And so I would say instead of waiting till you're an adult to like start this try to see what you do in this career, I would start right now, get creative and, and just create art. However that, however that, whatever that means to you, just start now. That's awesome. Great advice. Oh, and then um, read a lot, read a lot, watch a lot, learn a lot, cool. listen a lot. <laughs> do a lot, a lot. Do a lot, a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, Katie, it's, it's been a pleasure chatting with you today. Thank a you. lot of great advice. Um, if kids want to follow your career or connect with you on, on any social platform, is there a best place to find you online? Yeah, I'm on Instagram and uh, Twitter. You can follow me at Katie Von Till, and it's K-A-T-I-E-D-O-N-T-I-L-L. -L. I'm the same on all the platforms. Um, yeah. Perfect. Well, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show today. Thank Thanks you so for much. having me, Tyler.